Welcome to the Mr. Trovega YouTube channel. My name is Michael Piardi, and in today's video, you will discover the behind the scenes process and inspirations of Habash's latest album, Awakening. A fantastic work. If you haven't listened to it, I highly suggest to give it a spin because it is a beautiful wave of different sounds and inspirations. I'm really grateful for this conversation we had with the, the Basha within our club membership. And you will also hear Abashe's personal views and perspectives on how to promote your album through the promotion of his album release. Now, without further delay, let's get straight into the conversation. This is a snippet of our live Q&A session figuring it out on the instrument or actually composing a lot. And back then I had two major inspirations as an album and they kind of defined my way of production too. And one of them was, uh, was bending new corners from a trumpet player called Eric Trufa. Eric Trufa's, um, he had, uh, he had two very inspirational albums in the late nineties that were combining club music and jazz. And it was a combo record in the sense, like a classic jazz record in the sense that it was just four musicians, and one guest vocalist on a few tracks. But, but the reason it spoke to me a lot is that that was the first, that was the first record that I heard where live musicians were interpreting music that I heard as a young person going to the clubs, drum and bass and and electronic genres and hip hop in a very organic way where I, where it felt like this is a true like unique perspective and very authentic too and they on the album they do an amazing journey across genres but it's always the same four musicians with the same four instruments and and it was recorded in the same room live like a classic jazz record so the sonics are always the same and you can picture the four people play in front of you if you listen, but but the emotions and 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 inspirations are very broad, if that makes sense. And and that to me was an amazing thing. And and that's one that was one inspiration. And the other one was a Prince album mm. that is called the Rainbow Children, which is an early. It's from the early two thousands. It's not a really famous album, but that was the first Prince album that I got, and so I and 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 back then I had the uh, Walkmans. So, with the Walkmans, you kind of you were kind of uh, forced to listen things over and over again, and it was a pain to switch it. So you were sticking with one album for a longer period, and. I was listening both of these albums just like front to back, front to back, front to back, front to back. And and Rainbow Children was a was a huge influence. But that album, on the contrary, was using a lot of production and it, it felt like more like a collage because one track would be jazz and have one type of instrumentation. And the even in between a track, they would go to like different places and switch it up. And you know, you would hear a crazy guitar solo after an amazing funk section and and Latin breakdowns and and then uh, like a baroque interlude, you know, and it was just a trippy, like a crazy dream. So that was, I would say, the first record that got me into falling in love with production in that sense, you know, like curating an experience. And it felt like almost like a hip hop record in that sense, that it was organic sampling, like you draw all these inspirations from everywhere and there are no rules and you can go anywhere. And so in the beginning, uh, the, the closer I got to producing my own project, I was always referencing these two, like, am I doing a jazz record? Am I ready to be able to, to, to show a lot of inspiration through a small sound and a small combo? Or am I going rainbow and just layering the production, you know, like inviting session musicians and, uh, and, and doing uh, sampling and, and, and layering stuff like recording instruments on top of each other. And, and I grew up uh, in the era where the DAWs, so digital audio workstations and accessible audio production just got, um, you know, available 
widespread and we still had you know big pcs and everything but in high school i remember someone telling me for the first time there's this program called reason and you can you know it's actually a studio inside your computer and i was going crazy and i didn't i couldn't understand reason it was too overwhelming for me but then i got like a very old macbook and it had garage band on it and that was my first access to a production station in my computer and and me being an overthinker and probably a control freak as well, especially when it comes to your own music, you know, you you, you want to make the best possible. And, and it's kind of a, a blessing and a curse to give everybody <laughs> access to these computers because you have all the time in the world. It's like you, you know, putting a deadline. You, you can say whenever it's ready and you have, you can spend as much time as possible. You can do infinite revisions and, and so very naturally I went with the rainbow children way, which is just, you know, endless, endless exporting, inviting musicians until I feel it's ready, adding layers on top of layers and, and editing every single detail. Um, and so my first few projects were like that. Elevate um, yeah. being one, Elevate I did, yeah all the tracks in ableton and and i do always invited i was studying music at the same time but i and 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 so i always played live as well and i do i did invite um musicians but it was still you know live musical takes being edited and selected and chopped up and manipulated and all that and and um yeah, Invocation has more live recordings and, and live takes, and it does have a couple of fully live gems. But even those, I was selecting them carefully, and I did edits, and, and it still went through my Ableton thing. So okay. I often had, you know, I was cleaning up, right? And and Laroy, definitely. Laroy was the most um, in the box, so to say, because I really only had my laptop and the Zoom recorder, and, like, I was bored throwing microphones from friends in Brazil and so it's so yeah that one took like uh, years of of fine tuning and and I also never I'm I'm very self-conscious when I'm playing the instrument I started piano pretty late I was learning drums before drums were my first instruments and so to me to do an album that is fully live and that has improvisations and solos took a lot of courage and and honestly i was just never able to make that step i always pictured myself doing that music i always looked up to jazz musicians the most like in my head there are, there's no bigger achievement or even just nobody's cooler than a proficient jazz musician you know and yeah and it's a very profound thing to me so to to commit to an album that has live takes like that was just too much. And, and I always wanted to do it. And I guess after all the years of editing Laroye, I was at the place where I'm like, wow, I, I just want to play. And I also felt like with coming to Berlin and finding these people who collaborated on the album, I felt confident that, um, I felt confident saying that, okay, I think we have a sound that worth tracking live so sorry that that was a long story but but that's how that's how the idea of uh, awakening came it was always there i always wanted to do an album like this but i never i never i never made the step because i just never i never had the the, the guts to do it yeah yeah interest it's a very interesting what you said especially uh when it comes to your recent um the works and composition you said that um it took a lot of courage uh sabi yeah. um, working on awakening can you um can you break that down can you can can you expand a little bit more yeah. about that and I'm, I'm i'm imagine that you face challenges because you know um yeah, because, a new uh, thing for you yeah because when you um when you record the wave you record it, which is being in the same room and recording all the layers at the same time, it means that uh, you have very, very, very little room for correction, you know? And again, my generation, like we grew up in, in knowing that, you know, like basically everybody who is my age or younger is growing up in, 
with uh, with having access to unlimited editing and and perfecting everything. You know, you can loop anything. So a good example would be if uh, you have to do like a whatever funk tune and you're recording keyboards to it, uh, you know, you could play like uh, eight bars or 16 bars and you would say, yeah, the, uh, there is something cool here. Let's just like put it together and it's fine. Let's just go. This, this was a nice one, just copy paste it, you know, which is, which makes everybody more lazy just by default, you know? And, uh, and back in the days, like, people had like it wasn't even an option you know like if you had an ensemble you had to come in perform it all together and if you messed up and you had to do another thing you know it's expensive studio is expensive everything is expensive tape is expensive you would lose your job very quickly so i think uh it's just a whole different culture of recording that is you know i mean it's not it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse and like we lose something we gain something it's incredible to to do music this time and age and creativity is just you know doesn't have barriers you can do whatever you want but there is a culture of live music playing that is definitely just by default because of technologies getting lost and and so i think i see performing live like that this type of music as a statement in itself you know mm -hmm. and and it just took a lot to because again, I I also grew up doing hip hop and and electronic production, so I was very much um, I didn't end up being a performing jazz musician, improvising over changes every night. Um, so it was a big commitment, you know, to for me to say that okay, I'm gonna contribute to this culture of again live musical performances or call it jazz. You know it. Uh, I'm, I'm. I respect the recordings. I love a lot. I respect the musicians who do them a lot. And yeah, I just have this built-in filter in me. I, I look up to people who don't have it. You know, there are people who are just like it doesn't matter. But I'm very self-conscious like that, and it's not necessarily a good thing. But for me, it was very painstaking to be able. Even even on the day, like there are some songs where on the day when we recorded, I was like, yeah, that's definitely not going out because I hate it. Or even when I played it, <laughs> I was like the worst thing ever and then it took people around me to convince me that don't worry there is something in it and then it's and it's cool you know and uh, and i had to accept it so there was a lot of death in that yeah thing. yeah uh how much um um was important to you to uh be surrounded by the i mean by um, of course very gifted and talented musicians but also by the right people in terms of giving you um, the right encouragement and support, and direction, maybe. Um, what what was your experience in in collaborating with with your collaborators? Yeah, I still I still feel like I I more and more feel like I would love to work with an outside producer uh on a on a on a project in the future to have like a strong outside voice that is critical who's helping me make decisions but i'm a bit uh wary because i i also know that it will be very hard for me to give away the the lead you know yeah um i did i did consult a lot with my dear friend uh, wayne snow who i deliberately like met him and talked to him about the project and showed him the demos to uh, like him not being a participant directly to give me just feedback because I respect a lot his he always has a very strong artistic visions you know and kind of see like I have I have very much this insider music mu musician perspective you know um, understanding the structures and the chords and like like arranging from like inside of the music but he sees yeah. every all you know so he so I was consulting him mostly on the concept actually but then also the sound like what you know uh, i i i uh, i asked his opinion a lot okay but then uh the people i played with it was more about musical trust you know like uh these people i i would trust them blindly uh doing music anytime anywhere and and that safety net meant the most but we didn't discuss uh production that much you know it was pretty much left uh, to me to make decisions and yeah having the, the right team is definitely important but everybody needs to figure out on their own you know what is 
was the right setup for them, you know. Um, yeah, if I like that was in senses when someone wanted to handling a session and it's very emotional for me and it's very intense. So I had to tell them, uh, sorry, but I, I don't have the, the capacity to have this input now. Like I have to find my own way through it. So, you know, but there are some people who, who would benefit a lot from having someone who, who has strong and constant, like very on uh, hand opinions. What was it like for you promoting um, Awakening, uh, Sabi? And uh, how did you engage with your fans? during during the promotion uh process of, of of the album i had the pleasure to 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 attend your listening party on bandcamp which was a, a beautiful experience it was my first time and i and i think i i mean i highly suggest everyone taking advantage of this future because the it also offers a live chat where people can um can ask you questions and i and i saw a lot of people asking you questions about the album um yeah, and and another thing I wanted to ask you: uh, What was your experience um, doing this uh, um, Canon promotion on Bandcamp? Right, um, it's a uh, it's a uh, tough and confusing job. <laughs> I think everybody who's doing music here, uh, yeah, can relate. I think we are all involved. It's a confusing industry, man, and uh, and. Uh, my strategy was to find help because I knew that I'm not gonna be able to push through alone. Um, we almost, since I moved to Berlin, I always um, booked the PR agency uh, for my releases to help. Um, I, I basically learned about the industry when I moved here because back in Budapest, you only had an idea, you know, of how things work. And we look at the blogs. Back then it was blogs and SoundCloud. And when I yeah. moved here, I started to hear about TikTok and Instagram became bigger. Like, you know, like there are, it seems like there's a new trend and a new wave every like six months or, you know, like, you know, they change the algorithm and the trend like every three months, you know, and it's really hard and confusing to follow up, to be honest. So one thing we knew that uh, on a certain level, we wanted to make sure that uh, the the right people in the professional level and the industry hear it. So one thing that the agencies are doing is that they are targeting or like pitching it to people who are working at blogs and, uh, and yeah. printed uh, media and or radio. And to make sure that the people um, yeah, get it. Because one thing I realized is that everything is so saturated and and you can access everything uh, with the streaming platforms, but people are also getting overwhelmed by it. So there's a reason community radio and tastemakers are still a thing, you know, because people are overwhelmed by too many options. And if they just want to hear cool music, that is not you know their ipod with the same playlist for 15 years uh then the easiest is to turn on a cool show you know on worldwide fm or on bbc or wherever that you like you know and uh, it's uh, relatively easy to to dig in mix cloud you know and you just type in you know afro funk from the 80s mix and there will be plenty of mixes nowadays and and it's necessary. So people appreciate the, the 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 this type of filters, you know, and people who 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 do the job for them and like pre-select stuff. So so I think radio stations are still very relevant, either online or 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 real and um, radios and and medias. You know, some of the blogs, uh, some of the music magazines. There is there is still a market, even though it's niche and. And actually, the more niche it is, the better for me, in my view, because one thing that we can thank the internet is that no matter how small your 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 uh, genre is, on a global scale, it the, just by the rule of big numbers, it has the potential to to keep your project afloat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you do uh, nature, sound, ambient music, or neoclassical, or 
you know, death or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, through Bandcamp and through like socials, there is a chance to reach the people who will who will support it. And if you find enough of those people, you're good. And uh, and that's a, that's the inspiring thought that keeps me afloat, to be honest, uh, in this whole landscape of social media. Because um, that's the other thing. So yeah, like one thing is that we have an agency who is pitching the the big guns, the yeah. the media outlets, and I know that that's being taken care of. And and even with that, I often tell uh, or ask for as many interview possibilities as possible because I, I like to talk about the project in depth and it's and it feels much more genuine and authentic if I'm able to reply to questions and it's an exchange rather than me writing a long essay or like a pitch, you know, because these these PR pitches could be very dry as well. And so, yeah, uh, on that note, thanks for this opportunity because <laughs> this is exactly the type of format that I love, yeah. you know, and it's personal. And I got to express the things I need to express uh, 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 by myself. All right, so thank you, first and foremost, for watching this video. I do appreciate you taking the time to do it. I also do really hope you got something valuable from this snippet of our live q a session with Habashi. we explore many different topics and also we've been talking about the importance of cultivating a growth mindset and um, the challenges you might face on social media and clearing your mind of worries before performing live so if you're interested in hearing the full conversation just leave a message here in the comment section so that i can send you the link to join our club membership speaking of Abashe and his works i highly suggest you listen to this conversation i had with the uh, Abashe right here by clicking here as we've been talking about his 2021 album laroye make sure to subscribe to the music Tropica youtube channel so that you don't ever miss out on a new episode on all things black music and i'll see you in the next video with me michael piatti